So first off, everyone who's showed up today, just really want to thank you for uh, making the time and committing to this opportunity to live out one of our core values at Influencer, which is be a student. You know, we all want to get better. This is a huge opportunity to do that. Um, you know, we exist as a brand uh, to serve storytellers. That's our purpose statement. And since our founding in 2017, that purpose has been something we thought about with our athlete user community. Um, first and foremost, we now have 20,000 athletes who use the influencer app on a regular basis, but we've also tried to live out that purpose of serving storytellers by serving you, the community of professionals that work for sports teams, creating content, working in social media distribution, shooting content, doing all the different things you're doing on a daily basis in this fast growing part of the sports world, which is digital media, social media, and content. And so um, for me, uh, this whole situation that we've been put into, uh, this unprecedented time uh, of, of COVID-19 and, and staying at home being quarantined um, is something that I wanted to go to Nita Srikanth, our COO about, and ask her, how can we take this time, not just to serve the, the 20,000 athletes using our platform, celebrate their stories, a lot of their seasons have been abruptly ended, but how can we use this time to invest into our community of more than a thousand team officials like yourself who work in social and content and, and give back to you and help you get better, help you use this time to sharpen um, your toolbox. And Nita's one of you, right? Like she's worked for a team and led social for the Cowboys. She's worked at a media network like ESPN and IGN. And it's a big reason that I recruited her in 2019 to come on board as our chief operating officer and help lead the way for influencer into the future. Because I want us to represent you in everything that we can and will do with influencer. So with that being said, um, I'm really excited about this and what's to come with this series. And it's something that she has taken charge on and is, is really turned into a sub brand of influencer with now hundreds of you showing up today for the first of what will be a whole series of sessions. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Nita, but i um, really excited about what's to come and thankful that you've taken time to show up today. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, welcome to the first of many upcoming sessions of the Performance Academy. Really excited to have everyone here. We are starting things off uh, with a bang with Dan stepping in. Um, I hope everyone's safe during this wild time we're currently in. And again, thank you for taking the time to attend this session. The reason we put this together was with one goal in mind. We want to find the community of leaders that want to get better during this impacted environment we all find ourselves in and highlight some of the best teachers in the industry that can help teach you all what they've learned and share their wisdom with you. And again, we're starting off with one of the best I've ever come across in Dan. Um, I initially met him. I see you, Dan. Uh, I initially met him whenever I was at ESPN working Monday Night Football. He was with the Panthers, and um, we would exchange messages uh, anytime we were coming to Carolina or the Panthers were going to be on um, ESPN. And we just kept in touch throughout. And I've always found every all the work that he's done building the voice of every social um, team that he's been leading to be just genuinely refreshing, where you can have. Um, a tone that is not only playful, but it's respectful as well. So I'm, I'm excited for him to share some of his tactics when it comes to social monetization. Um, but first, some housekeeping. Um, for those of you that are unaware, we have a bunch of sessions that are up on our site. Go there, sign up. These are built for you to help get better at your craft. At Influencer, our purpose really is about serving storytellers. And now with the impact of COVID-19 on the sports industry, we want to help our community, regardless of whether you're a client of ours or not, get better during this downtime so that when sports comes back, the bar will be raised across all facets, including the content you are creating. Our tech platform, as many of you know about us, we are empowering more than 20,000 athletes to have their own voice and share their own content. And these sessions are about empowering you the community that powers them. So if you can't attend, all these sessions are going to be available for you um, to view after we're done on our blog, YouTube, and social platforms. So follow us on our social uh, accounts for up-to-date info and, and links. 
And for those of you that are wanting to connect and meet new people, we have 56 of you uh, here, which is a, a great number. Drop a link to your Twitter account or LinkedIn in the chat box. Um, I encourage you all to network with those to share that um, drive the have the same drive as each and every one of you. And throughout this presentation, as you are following along, submit your questions in the questions feature. At the end of the presentation, I'll ask Dan some of the ones that make sense towards the end, but I'll also interrupt Dan throughout to uh, any questions that come up that are about the topic he's discussing. And in the event that we lose connection and there's some technical difficulties, just bear with us. Dan will get back on ASAP. I'll pop on and try to entertain you all. For those of you who know me, I'm a decent entertainer. Um, and with that, I want to ha start handing it over to Dan. Excited to have him share his mindset on social monetization tactics. Um, when I talk to people in the community, I'm often taken aback by how there's not much consideration about the fact that content is a business. Um, and a rule of thumb in sports really is, regardless of what organization you're in, you need to remember where the money is flowing from and how can I help increase the bandwidth of our, my own department to get more resources. Um, and this session is going to be important for you to understand how you can tactically bring monetization strategies to your current or future role. Um, so Dan, you're up. Great. Uh, first off, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes. You're right. You're all on mute, but I'm looking at the chat. Thank you, Tyler, and some others there. Appreciate that. Well, firstly, I uh, hope everybody is uh, is staying safe. Is uh, you know, is social distancing and all that stuff. I know that's uh, some pretty pretty wild times we're living through right now. But uh, I hope we're all staying safe. Um, small heads up, my cat might jump on the desk, so apologies for that. Uh, I'm going to dive into the deck uh, that Nita's team uh, helped me construct. I uh, really appreciate that. I basically word vomited uh, a whole outline uh, onto a, uh, a Word doc, and they were nice enough to construct a, a, a beautiful PowerPoint for me. So before I do that, I've got to close my door because my daughter is uh, in nap time right now. So two seconds, spray it back. Okay, now I'm going to screen share. And again, let's see, this guy here, this guy here. I'm gonna make sure that we're viewing this the right way. I haven't used PowerPoint in a while. Reading view, okay, and then, okay, so. That should be that right there. I'm going to make sure that looks good. Okay, I think we're in good shape there. Um, gonna just dive right in. I'm gonna try to make this as um, conversational as possible. Uh, if y'all have ever talked to me in person before, I tend to ramble. Um, this is gonna be my best effort at trying to keep uh, kind of a coherent thought process here. So this this deck is uh, intended to sort of keep me on track, I'm just gonna sort of crack my skull open and start pouring out all the little tricks I've learned over the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and then if y'all have any questions, uh, Nita, please be, uh, you're welcome to interrupt me as many times as you like. Uh, I'm happy to, to, uh, to dive in or anything. But with that, I wanna give a little bit of background of my personal experience. Um, so I got my start in the sports industry. Um, prior to that, I was in advertising, but uh, my first job was with the Carolina Panthers on the sports side. And um, I w basically was brought in um, to uh, oversee their digital properties. So their social, uh, their mobile app, their uh, eventually was involved in their website, their email marketing, uh, a number of things. So um, that gave me a good feel for um, digital in the sports landscape as well as uh, how I was going to fit into the overarching um, part of the organization. Hold on, my cat just jumped on the desk. Uh, all right. Uh, so after about six years there of uh, you know building up uh, their digital presence uh, over at the Panthers, and we were lucky we had Cam Newton and Luke Keekley and some really special seasons. So that made my job a lot easier, um, kind of building a social voice and uh, a successful uh, digital platform. I uh, decided we're going to go back home to the New Jersey, New York area, and I took a job with Brooklyn uh, Sports Entertainment, um, where they were the, the Nets, uh, to a smaller degree, the New York Islanders, uh, Barclays Center, and a few other uh, boxing properties, things, uh, things like that, where I oversaw their digital and social strategy. Uh, and after about a year there, um, really, my goal was always to come back down to the Carolinas, so I... Um, 
was lucky enough to have a job open up with the Hurricanes. Then I moved uh, down to Raleigh about uh, two years ago, and uh, it's been uh, it's been a great move for me and my family. We're, we got roots down here. We like it a lot. Uh, hockey's been a lot to learn, but it's been great sort of building out their, their digital and overall kind of brand presence over the past couple of years there. So one thing I want to dive into, and we'll we'll go further into this, is you know we're all we're all working with different organizations right now. Um, we're all um, you know, part of uh, different leagues, teams, maybe we work with agencies, um, and how we monetize is always going to be dramatically different. Um, so that's uh, one thing I want to dive into is the differences here between the places I've been at, because it may add some perspective uh, if you guys are in similar situations. Um, with the Panthers, our, our monetization opportunities were were very different. Um, we had a very robust season ticket base, uh, so that means we didn't really have a ton of individual game tickets to sell. And the way our merchandise deals worked, uh, we were making a fraction of a dollar per every dollar sold. So really, our our key revenue opportunities were um, were through sponsorship activation, specifically sponsored content. So that was an area we looked to get uh, as strong as possible in because as uh, our owner at the time said, our, our number one goal is to win games. Uh, the number two goal, or 1A, is to make money. Um, so that was our avenue there, was through sponsorship activation, partnership marketing. With the Nets, it was a little different. Um, we had a lot more tickets to sell. Um, so that was a situation where uh, we had to be uh, strategic with our paid advertising, with our, our lead gen, with, uh, with sort of every type of revenue opportunity. And the fact that we were in the New York markets uh, made it, um, gave us an advantage with, uh, with partnerships and opportunities there. Uh, and the merchandise game is a little different too. The Nets uh, were leaders in hat sales at the time on the NBA side. And that's something that we factored into a lot of our marketing strategy as well. Uh, with the Hurricanes, different too. Uh, we do have tickets to sell. We uh, are a, a hockey team in a non-traditional market, so there's challenges there. Um, but there's also opportunity too with uh, different partners to generate uh, yeah, money off our digital and social platforms through sponsorship activation. And uh, the merchandise opportunities are significantly different here with the Hurricanes. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, as well. But uh, what I'm getting to here with this little bit of a <clears throat> of a ramble is uh, winning is the number one goal and making money is 1A. Of course, we're in the business of, of making money. Um, but the key thing in here is there's always going to be different ways to generate revenue uh, using your social platforms. It's about what fits best for your organization and trying to make that as best as it can be. And those are some of the things we're going to dive into here over the next uh, 29 or so slides. So hope you all have lunch. Hey, Dan. Uh, yes. If yes. You look at your experiences in the NBA and, the NFL mm -hmm. and now the NHL. What would you say is like the biggest difference between the three sports? Well, from a social content standpoint, it's very much the uh, the storytelling. From a for yeah, you know, in the NFL, it's uh, everything is built towards Sunday. Uh, the entire narrative um, is focused on on that one day, that one game. It all culminates there. So every piece of content you have essentially points it at that one day, and then you turn the page. Um, in the NBA and the NHL, um, you, you have a lot more games per week, so you can turn the page a lot quicker if you lose, which is great because then you can go on a small win streak and all of a sudden you have a new story to tell. Um, but it also changes the way you tell stories and how you strategize and build out your content and the workflows that you have to establish in order to, to not burn out your people or, more importantly, uh, tell the right stories at the right time. So um, the, the game difference is, is the easy one. Uh, but from a, a monetization standpoint, you know, we all have different opportunities because of, A, the number of games uh, or uh, the lack thereof. So that, that's the big difference that I've uh, kind of observed in my time there. Um, I'm sure there's more, and we might get into a couple of them as we go further on, but cool. a great question there. Thanks. All right. Um, back to the deck here. So why is monetization important? Obviously, I went into that. We're all in the business of making money. If we're not making money for our team, um, we're probably not doing our jobs right. Uh, it's it's important to uh, to always maintain best practices. You don't want to sacrifice doing your job the right way or what you feel is the right way um, just to make a quick buck, but there are ways to meet in the middle and there are a number of ways to sort of progress towards that. So consider the sources and your organization. We dove into that a little bit. For some of you guys, it, it might be purely um, 
season tickets. And if that's the case, uh, you know, lead gen ads on Facebook or Instagram are going to be a big piece there. If you have a very robust ticketing sales staff, um, if, if you have already sold out every game, um, maybe that's not the option and maybe it is sponsored content. There's a bunch of different ways you can generate revenue. It's about what's the best fit. And um, for most of us, it's probably going to be a little bit of everything. But uh, it really does depend on your organizational goals, uh, your staffing, and sort of uh, the, I guess you could say, the objectives that leadership has uh, laid before you. So again, ticket sales, sponsor activation, merchandise sales, uh, and indirect revenue is kind of, it's obviously very challenging to measure, but as you elevate the value of the brand through proper social media practices and content strategies and general brand growth, there is revenue to be had through that, whether it's taking the time to interact with your fans on Twitter, perhaps one of them ends up buying a jersey because of that. There's, uh, you know, do, following the best practices the right way will often lead to revenue opportunities that you can later capitalize on. The one thing that I wanna focus on here though is um, social media does not work for organic ticket sales in most cases. Uh, many of us, probably all of us, have been pressured at some point to say, all right, just get that ticket message out there, uh, tweet it out, put it on Facebook. And if we all have the proper tracking mechanisms in place, we all realize that, uh, you know, that didn't really work. Uh, I can say from personal experience, it rarely, rarely has, unless it's, uh, you know, game seven of the playoffs, uh, you're really you're probably not going to move a lot of tickets uh, through organic social. But if you do social the right way, if your content builds a relationship with your audience, it makes people want to buy tickets. And that's the key. And that's something that it's very important to communicate to uh, leadership positions across your organization as you explain sort of what your strategy is going to be. So let's get into that a little bit because before you can monetize, uh, it all starts with the right process and the right communication and the right relationship. So I'm just gonna get all these out here so I Oh, okay. Um, so number one, communication is the foundation of all relationships. It is the foundation of a successful organization. It's the key to success in every phase, whether it's how you communicate and what communication processes you have in place with your creative staff or how you communicate uh, certain objectives to other department heads. Um, communication it helps you build relationships. And if you don't have the right relationships in place with your partnership and sponsor sales staff, your merchandise team, your ticketing team, the rest of your marketing or social and digital team, um, it's going to be really, really hard to be successful generating uh, revenue and monetizing your social properties. Number two is proactiveness. This one is so, so important because um, one, you cannot bank on other departments understanding the digital landscape the way that you and your team does. So it's it's very important to communicate, but also get ahead of of others uh, basically selling off your social before you have a chance to to do it the right way. So something I'll get into a little later on in this presentation is if you don't dictate what your strategy is and what your monetization tactics are ahead of time, there's a really good chance it's going to be dictated to you. So being proactive is a key to success here, whether it's building an inventory list, uh, you know, as early as possible in your off season or constantly communicating with your sponsorship team uh, about new revenue opportunities or, um, explaining uh, and showing case studies of why uh, paid social is much more effective for selling tickets or generating leads than, uh, than perhaps an organic social post. Uh, that's all very, very important. So communication and proactiveness are really going to help save you a lot of trouble, but it takes commitment for those two things. Now, the three Ps, going to get to those later. If you have ever seen any presentation I've done, um, I have gone to this very cliched well uh, a couple of times um, but these are things that work uh, they have worked for me over the past uh, couple of years and uh, and it, it does have a, a role in how you uh, build a process to properly monetize uh, your social properties so um, we'll get to that later um, another thing very important understand your audience um, there are some fancy tools out there uh out the hurricanes we use track maven um, we've partnered with wasserman to develop a rate card and, and enhance our market research and other organizations i've worked with nielsen or gum gum or similar um properties there that can allow you to better evaluate your social and also understand your audience um, and there's a lot of reasons why that is important and it doesn't always need expensive software to, to help figure out who your audience is. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, they all have native analytics tools that'll give you an idea of uh, 
the demographics that follow you, but um, important for a lot of reasons. One, um, let's say on the sponsorship side, it's uh, incredibly important to understand if you have an audience or, or a segment of your audience that aligns with a partner, that could be the difference between closing a deal with you versus a, a local competitor. Um, in other cases, it's also how are you going to build the content uh, that will appropriately um, carry this message to generate revenue. Um, a great example is uh, if you have a, a ticket subscription package that appeals to uh, a younger audience, perhaps uh, messaging that with a paid strategy on uh, Instagram stories uh, or TikTok is going to be a lot more effective than uh, a organic Facebook post or an email or something of that nature. So um, always important, understand your audience. Um, you don't even have to go too in depth with that, but just a basic understanding of the demographics that make up the key parts of your social audience. It can never hurt. The more information you have, the better. Just wanted to make sure I threw that one out there. So, um, all right. So step one. Sponsored content. Um, this is probably something that we all deal with uh, or have dealt with in, in some um, point in our, uh, our careers here on building social content. Um, and to me, it is not necessarily the easiest option to monetize your social. It's just one that is probably the most common. Um, so always an option. Um, but let's get to the three P's. Uh, it does require you to kind of be on your game with these three things. Um, people will always be the most important part of what we do. Uh, it is important to maintain relationships. It's important to invest in people. Um, are your creatives positioned for success the right way when talking about video content or design content? Um, are you bringing in the right people to build uh, these things? Are, are the right people being proactive when communicating these monetization messages to uh, the ticketing team or to your sales team or even to to your marketing team. Um, so people, number one, always important, invest in them uh, because they're the ones that are gonna be, uh, you know, really doing a lot of the legwork when they build out that content. So planning, number two, they're very, very important. Um, you do have to understand what makes sense to monetize and being proactive, as I mentioned, in building inventory lists and communicating what is available. Um, if you don't go ahead and do that, this is how you get deals that are typically sold that have like, all right, 15 Facebook posts in a month uh, in order to promote uh, buying tires from a local mechanic. That's, uh, you know, for a salesperson, that might be something that makes sense. But for a lot of us, we know that not only is that not going to be effective for your brand, the fans probably don't care about it and it really won't benefit the partner that much either. So being proactive and being first uh, and building out what makes sense to have uh, as a sponsored piece of content um, is always going to help you. And process, um, this is really about the, the culmination of people in planning. Um, it is uh, when you have your staff uh, that, that knows their, their role and their function um, really well and they can execute it the right way, that puts you in position to capitalize when monetization opportunities come uh, you know, available. It also makes it so you are not overtaxing your creative staff with uh, a bunch of projects that, yes, they make revenue, but is the cost a major resource drain? So always take these three things into account when kind of mapping out any type of monetization opportunity or really any marketing opportunity. They've helped me a ton. Um, it's the things, the lens that I kind of look through when, when I strategize and plan, um, and they've helped me a lot, but they will help with this sponsored content stuff, which I will continue diving into. So yeah, real quick on this. Yes. So a lot of, I think this applies to a lot of people that are, are, are paying attention to this, but sometimes there's some legacy mindset in the organizations that we're in and people don't truly understand how social is not necessarily a distribution model. It's more of a fans are there yeah. to create unique content for that platform in the way mm. that they are consuming that. How do you kind of stymie the take this two minute, 30 second piece of video and just slap it across all platforms and call it a day? How do you, how do you change that mentality in internally? Uh, a lot of patience. Um, <laughs> It starts with that um, because it's not always it's not always going to be easy. Um, it's 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 not always going to be perfect the first time out. 
um, it's going to take time. It, it, it took us years at the Panthers to, to figure out the right method to monetize and build the stuff out the right way and to sort of experience that shift between the deals getting done before uh, the digital team had a chance to really evaluate and, and optimize them. So it does take patience and, and that factors into the relationship piece of this. So uh, proactive communication and, and consistent communication, um, which can be something like um, examples of things that did perform well for other organizations or teams or things that didn't, but also your own numbers and analytics, uh, ways to back it up. Um, that's one reason why we use TrackMaven um, at the Hurricanes. It's, uh, it's a good tool for tracking not only the uh, social effectiveness, the, the basic metrics that we all have known to come in, we, we love those metrics, uh, but also the perceived value of it. Did it generate uh, good value for the partner? And uh, constant education and constantly evangelizing, it requires dedication, but that's the key to any type of shift because the bottom line is that if the campaign doesn't perform well, that is a poor reflection on, on our department uh, as a social and digital staff. It is a, a poor reflection on the partner. It's a poor reflection on the sales team as well. And they, uh, the sponsor may be less likely to, um, to re-up really if, if the stuff doesn't perform well. So really uh, it has to check those three boxes. And the only way to, to properly have others understand that is with frequent effective communication um, and a lot of patience. So it's gonna suck for a couple of years for some. That's just the, the long and short of it, but uh, you have to stick with it and, and show that there's a better way. Um, and also be open to others' ideas. Just because we are the ones that are in the digital space more frequently, it doesn't mean we can discount uh, the ideas of our sales staff. This is a uh, collaboration is, is a key to success in any industry and being open to the ideas of others and welcoming and, and whether we use it as an education opportunity or whether we use it as an opportunity to um, to like to take their ideas and work with them and enhance them. Um, that's something that can't be discounted either because that is a factor in relationship building. So that's my long rambling answer to that question. But uh, patience is probably the, the one word short answer to it. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, sponsored content. Um, hold on, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint deck. Uh, logo slaps are easy. You look at score graphics, you look at, uh, you know, the player of the game type stuff. It's, um, it, it's easy, you know, you throw it on there, maybe you tag him in the tweet or you tag him in the Instagram post. I don't feel that easy means lazy. I think easy means efficient in most cases, especially if this is content you are already planning on building out. If you, know, if you are running social and digital for a sports organization, you're gonna have score updates. Why not throw a sponsor logo on there, especially if it means that you feel you can do it in line with best practices, like uh, not having the sponsor's name in the copy, but making sure they get the visibility they need um, and educating your sales team is that this is similar to a, a banner ad in, in, in a stadium or a, a dasher board ad. Um, but if it's part of the process that's already established, you are just making money for doing your job that's already been, you know, done. So very, very important. Uh, score graphics, top performers. You probably could come up with a dozen examples of the game day menu of content, um, you know, and things that really don't add a lot of additional work to the defined process. Um, so additional stuff. You want to look for relevancy in a clean fit. If, uh, you know, you have a, uh, a top performers graphic and you have, uh, well, it's a bad example. If, say you have a score graphic and if your team wins and you put a sponsor logo on there, um, you know, Party City or maybe a beer company might be a better fit than like, you know, Jim's garage down the street or, or, you know, in other cases, you want to find the right partner for the right activation. Not always the case, but it is something that should factor into the discussion as you work through this with your sales team. What makes sense for both, uh, you know, brands. And as I mentioned, if, if this campaign doesn't perform well, it's going to hurt both parties. So you have to be upfront and clear with kind of what's going to be effective and what's not. Um, so a good activation will make sense for your team and your brand, the fans, like uh, say there's a thing where if your team wins, they uh, get a discount on a fast food deal, right? Well, if it's a free sandwich, you're going to get a lot more performance, or even if it's something free, it's going to perform a lot better than if it's like, uh, you know, oh, you get like 30 cents off your drink or something. It's, uh, it has to be something that provides value for, for all parties in some capacity if it's a conditional deal. It has to make sense for the partner too. Um, if you can check these three boxes, 
um, with any type of, of sponsored activation on your social feed or sponsored content piece, then I, I think that it is something that's going to be successful. But you have to be upfront with the fact that these three boxes have to be checked for everybody. The, your partner has to be aware of these three conditions, your sponsorship team does, and of course, your, your digital and your, your content team does. Additionally, um, and this goes for all kind of content strategies, um, it's really easy to look at what everybody else does and, and feel intimidated or, or feel like maybe your content might not measure up in some ways. Um, the truth of the matter is that um, no team can do every single thing right. Maybe if someone does video right, maybe their photography is lacking, or perhaps there's a team that's really, really, really good with uh, you know, graphic design, but they don't have the best editorial content. Uh, look for what is, is, is going well. Maybe your staff is really good with podcasting. Um, I firmly believe in identifying your strengths and making them uh, stronger and augmenting them rather than looking for something that is perhaps uh, a little more average and trying to you know, make that um, what, it, what it can't be. So lean into your strengths. Uh, if you have an amazing photographer on staff, are there ways to monetize that photography? Uh, is it a photo of the game type of thing? Is it travel photos when the team gets on the plane or on the bus? Um, all very important to understand what works, uh, not only from a quality standpoint, but from a process standpoint. If you have a really, really great graphic design team and they can churn out content, uh, really, really top notch stuff faster than any other department, lean into that. Perhaps uh, monetizing those graphics or developing a series of these things is your path to victory rather than maybe if you have a smaller video team and they can't build out as much as quickly, well, perhaps that you repurpose them in a different way. So um, again, developing your inventory list uh, and constantly adding to it is a very, very important thing to do because if you don't do this, uh, you're gonna have people that perhaps aren't as well versed in social and digital kind of selling deals on your behalf. So be proactive, understand what you wanna sell and also understand what you don't wanna sell. I've seen some teams that don't feel comfortable selling their final score graphics because they feel that that's something that has a lot of value without a partner on it. That's fine. You have to understand what fits for your brand and understand what you want to make available. And if it's everything but that, fine. If it's two or three graphics per game or, or over the off season, whatever that may be, um, figure out what you want to sell and explain why. And that's where communication and relationships come into play. So, all right, sponsored content. Um, if you think about every type of content you're able to produce, you can find a way to make some money off it, whether it's something as simple as a logo slap or even readjusting a campaign to be something that is uh, a little more in line with a sponsor, whether it's something like keys to the game or if it's an off day training piece of content, editorial, podcast, whenever it may be. Um, if you think about it hard enough and you have an interested party uh, at, from a sponsor, there are ways to make this work. It could be something as simple as a retweet to win giveaway. If you have some gift cards and some team gear, um, not only are you getting tons of retweets, but you're also uh, you know, satisfying a, a sponsor uh, obligation there too. So uh, I don't think you should ever limit your uh, inventory list to just the uh, the regular season. A lot of teams do. Um, right now, sports, uh, well, not right now, but uh, when sports comes back, it's uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a year round activity. Um, so things like draft coverage and free agency and uniform or schedule announcements, national days, uh, Lord knows there's a national day for every single thing. Um, these can all be relevant. If you have a pizza partner and national pizza day is October or March or whatever, find a way to work together. Just because it's not a recurring deal doesn't mean it's not effective. And if you can get way ahead of these things and look at these national day calendars and find an opportunity to provide some value for a partner, that's just going to enhance the relationship down the line or maybe make them more likely to renew. So all valuable stuff. There. Hey Dan, uh, on the renewal, yes. uh, what, what, what have been some of the like quick turn templated approaches that have driven a high percentage of renewal? Well, Is it more you know, like tweet to win? Is it more of just like a, a basic branded content? What, what has been sort of the go-to for uh, a lot of times it is, um, it depends on the partner in a lot of ways too. In our cases, it's, it's um, a lot about the relationship that pre-exists with specific partners and how we're going above and beyond. Um, but it's also about hearing their needs. Uh, one good case here is um, we partner with a, a, um, 
I have, for lack of a better word, a, a invisible braces uh, teeth partner kind of thing. And uh, they're, they're a wonderful partner that we've had. And uh, our first time out, our, our social activation for them was they were on our lineup graphics. Um, you know, and, and that was effective, you know, because you've, you know, you're lining up your teeth the right way and, uh, you know, it kind of aligns. But to be honest with you, by the time the year was over and while that content did perform well from a metric standpoint, they weren't really interested in having that back again. It just wasn't a fit for the direction they wanted to go uh, as a brand. So we came up with a few new ideas and we aligned some of our um, in-game social activations like the... Uh, you know, share your photos with a specific hashtag. It'll be on the video boards. Uh, we partnered with uh, 15 Seconds of Fame to um, to develop a content uh, piece that would uh, people could download the clips of themselves on the video boards. It was much more in line with smiles and having fun and being at the game rather than a piece of hockey-focused content. And uh, that actually made them uh, more likely to renew was listening to what their needs were uh, and truly understanding kind of what their goals were. And, you know, if, if I had my way, I, I'd rather put them on something hockey related because it's, it's a little easier. Um, it's, 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 you add a logo to the mix there and it's something we're already doing, but it's also in my head, um, lineups and aligning your teeth, so that makes sense. Yeah. But, um, so I think the key there is it comes back to relationships and it comes back to understanding what they want, listening to them and finding a solution. Um, all of us in, in some form, uh, where we have to be in a solution-based industry. And if we can't find those solutions, they won't be as likely to renew or come back. And sometimes social can be a deal breaker there. So, um, but it does depend on the partner and, and sort of their needs and goals. Cool. All right, I see Bojangles in the thread there. So, oh, Mike Mahoney is here, that's wonderful. I love that guy. He was fantastic to work with at the Panthers, I have to say. All right, so back to the, uh, back to the, the deck here. All right, additional content, giveaways we mentioned, video, all that. Look, uh, y'all do content, so I won't dive too deep into it. I have more uh, fun stuff I can share. Um, podcasts, all this, I mean, you don't need inspiration from me right now, but the goal here is that um, if you try hard enough, everything could be sponsored in some way, as long as it's done tastefully and uh, sort of in line with the, your vision. Um, the key there is you wanna collaborate with your sales team to, to provide the most value for the partner without sacrificing the quality of the product. So moving on, um, this is something that uh, I've, I've learned and picked up from a few of our consultants over the years is that, and y'all probably already know this, video is the, uh, the most valuable asset that you have. It's the most challenging to consistently produce. It requires some tremendous talent to do the right way, especially in a social landscape. But a video series uh, produced for social uh, of high quality, um, that should get you the most revenue uh, out of everything. It's, uh, but it, it costs money to do. It's, it's a resource stream. Um, it might take several video producers to create a behind the scenes series, for example, that, that is worth uh, a major partner. But um, if, if you are after kind of the, the, the big pieces here, the video is something that is, uh, it should be worth the most and it should be priced and valued uh, as such. So again, we all know how much video takes to produce, so I don't have to, to bore you with that stuff. Um, one last thing as it gets to people, um, you know, the, the, we all deal with this in a different uh, level, but uh, especially with video producers and creative producers, seasons are long. And the key is you don't want to burn your people out because not only will you not get as much creativity and effectiveness out of them, uh, I believe that continuity is a key to success uh, in sports. So if you are constantly churning through people, um, you're really not going to be able to do the same quality of work that is worthy of monetization. So uh, that's something to be important that you're not... Um, you know, overdoing it with your inventory lists and you're making it clear to your partnership team that uh, perhaps if they want a video series, maybe it's something that needs to be outsourced and paid for. Or maybe a, a external agency produces this video series uh, rather than the internal one. So uh, definitely important thing. Um, you don't want to let someone else fill your plate. I mean that with being proactive with inventory, um, but also with, uh, you know, people assigning responsibilities for these sponsor projects. So I have an example here of uh, an issue, you know, we kind of dealt with at the, the Canes. Um, you know, we have a fantastic design team, um, but like any design team, they have a ton of projects. And um, one thing we, I personally didn't want to have them worry about was graphics that would be obsolete minutes after uh, we posted them, like score graphics or 
uh, you know, the stats from each period or whatever it may be. So we wanted to improve our workflow. We wanted to further improve our content. Uh, so we partnered with an agency to develop real-time graphics that uh, are, are produced for the in-game storytelling from our projected lineup early in the morning to all the way to the, the final recap piece. Uh, this agency is, is paid a certain amount to, to produce these graphics for us for each and every game. And uh, so we work with Foxhammer, that's the name of them. Some of you may have, may have heard of them. Uh, I've worked with them for a number of years. Um, and we identified this game day menu of graphics that help us tell the story. Um, again, all obsolete minutes after sharing them, um, but we find a way to tie a sponsor to just about each and every one. So from the projected lineup, which is Sheets, uh, if you guys are familiar with that uh, that brand, all the way through our um, Eye on the Numbers piece, which is a, a laser eye surgery clinic here in the Carolinas. Um, you know, we, we make sure that every piece, just about every piece is, is partnered uh, or has a sponsor in some way. And at that rate, we're actually generating significant revenue off this deal. We're, we're not just breaking even. We're actually making significant money while taking stress off of our design team, further enhancing our content strategy, and we're making our workflow more efficient for our social team who are not putzing around in Photoshop uh, in between periods trying to make sure the score graphic is right. So, you know, we're, we're hitting on all those boxes. We now have a much larger menu of content and uh, we're making money. So that's the key where this can be, if done right, uh, sponsor and partnership marketing on the social landscape should make a profit for you but also should make your product better. Um, and if you build the right relationship with your team to do so, you'll, you'll achieve that. But it does take time and patience. So um, any questions while I kind of take a little break there? Oh, Zach Roberts has a question. I see it. Dan, I got a couple questions here coming in. Yeah. Let's get to Zach Roberts first. How would sure. you suggest when looking at biting off more than you can chew to explain to people higher up than you? That focusing on sports with larger followings might be a better course of action than not doing much of substance for all sports. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Zach. Um, let me process that one for a second so I answer it well. Um, well, it does go back to patience and relationship building. And look, the honest truth is not every uh, ownership um, not everyone's going to get it always. Uh, that's the reality of the situation. Um, but, uh, the key here is, is that you have to really just try your best to manage that down. Uh, a lot of times we're in positions where we do oversee creative staff. Um, and the key is to try to limit that or find solutions that can, can manage those expectations a little bit better. Um, I think numbers do a really, really good job of showcasing value um, and the commitment it takes to do things the right way and the benefit. Um, so I do think a, a constant dialogue of what performs well and what doesn't um, and explaining what actually went into it is, is very important. Um, hopefully, you know, that leads to continued discussion of, of this is why this works, this is why this doesn't. But ultimately, it, it takes patience and understanding um, and really building a case over a, a longer period for uh, the most senior leadership to understand the resources that go into doing this the right way um, and the expectations that are associated with it. So probably there's more of a rambling answer than an effective one, but uh, I do think it takes uh, one of the things, uh, yeah. I, one of the things that I've always struggled with throughout my career, yeah. some of the spots previously I've been in, is that yeah. you know you got to figure out what the ROI is of your own time and how exactly. you can help make the case through data that I can do ten tweets for this account that has a hundred k followers, or I can make ten videos for this account that has two million. What would it's you rather me do? do? It's tough. It really is because like you're going to get a lot of conflicting directives there. You know, this SID might want, uh, you know, you to focus on volleyball, which isn't a big sport, whereas yeah. basketball might be the goal. Um, I hate to say it, but it, it does boil down to numbers, um, but that isn't always going to satisfy everybody. The nature of what we do is a lot of times we're tasked with saying no, and yeah. we're not always going to have a big answer or the right answer or or one that uh, that makes everybody happy. But the sooner we get more comfortable with that, uh, 
the more effective. And if it's something that, you know, you fear job security over, let's say, um, you know, it, it does come with the territory, but that's where I think numbers back this up and ROI, as Nita said. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's no different than if you look at the ticket numbers for each uh, sport to understand, well, where's the interest here uh, and what should we be devoting our time to? Mm -hmm. um, well, I haven't spent a lot of time and well, I haven't spent any time in college sports, uh, so I probably am not the best equipped to answer that. But I do think that um, the, the pro sport equivalent would be something like, you know, you have your main brands that you focus on the, the the team accounts and sometimes you have secondary ones that perhaps focus on the hype team or the mascot or the PR team, whatever it may be. Um, and I, I think those should never be getting a ton of resources to them, unfortunately. Perhaps the mascot you can make a case for mm -hmm. simply because you're not going to get the revenue opportunities out of, out of those as you would with the other sports. So it comes down to numbers. It comes down to dollars and cents, unfortunately. But it also is a very delicate situation to navigate and uh, one that requires a lot of relationship building and a lot of trust and uh, a lot of patience to to show why uh, it's more effective to spend your time on probably the, the key sports rather than perhaps some of the smaller ones in some cases. Yeah, we live in an industry where fan sentiment, data, performance, all of that is happening in real time so we can help make content decisions and, and really um, resource decisions in real time because of that. And mm -hmm. the way you're gonna move mountains especially with organizations that have a lack of understanding and knowledge of how digital should be working uh, it's, and how to connect with the next generation of your fan, the most effective way to do it is to show the numbers, show the data, and boiling it down into that. That's the most effective tool at your disposal to make any case that you need to. And obviously there's gonna be times where uh, leadership is not gonna agree um, it's going to be because the, the, the thing I hate hearing the most is this is how we've always done it. And that drives me nuts. Um, but ultimately, dollars and cents, you know, are going to be at a, at a point where you might not ultimately get what you want to do. But as long as you make your case, you stand up on your table that you need to do, you'll be able to make that by, by leveraging the data that's at your fingers. Exactly. And if there's a way to compromise and meet in the middle on certain things, for example, if you perhaps monetize uh, football or basketball uh, in a way that generates some profit, can those dollars be used to purchase some graphics for perhaps a sport that doesn't have the following yet so you can build that out? Um, it, 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 it takes a lot of strategy, I'm sure, but it does come down to numbers and relationships. Hey, Dan, we got um, a couple more questions here I want to get. Um, sure. We're going to go from Andrew Hamilton for the quality is greater than quantity discussion. How do you emphasize the impact of each post versus series of posts to your sales team? Um, well, I hate to say it again, but it's it, it does come down to numbers, um, but also it, it takes the relationship and trust, really. Um, I, I think that in some cases it's easier to make uh, an example of the um, your final score if you win graphic and how that will perform versus the, um, the second period stats, for example. So I do think it's, it's outlining the value. Um, this is where uh, a rate card um, probably comes into play too, uh, because you can look at the numbers at a, at a more larger scale and try to define the value for some of these posts and then explain why, okay, well, this one-off, you know, sponsoring the schedule graphic, it's a big deal because you can get a lot of visibility on it. That is probably just as valuable as these, you know, 10 smaller posts here because they're going to perform less well. They're, they're, they're throwaway stuff. If you can, uh, one thing I found success with is if you can compare it to terms that are in line with more traditional media and sponsorship opportunities, uh, then that typically will kind of build that bridge there. Uh, right now, we're still, even though digital and social has been around for like 10 years in, in this kind of landscape, we're still in a stage where a lot of the people selling digital and social are more comfortable with, with print or with radio or broadcast or even uh, in, in venue ads. Um, and if there's a way to kind of make a comparison there, sometimes that... Um, you know, sometimes that, that performs a little better. Uh, so that has been successful for me uh, in that landscape. But uh, a lot of it comes down to numbers, performance, and kind of building out a rate card, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute here. Awesome. I want to keep pushing you through your deck because we're starting to get a little short on time. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of questions, but I want, I want you to try sure. to as much as Definitely, definitely. Um, rate cards, important tool. So a good segue there. They can be a challenge to develop. Uh, 
we've we partnered with Wasserman over the past year to develop one for us that uh, and they took into account our, our metrics across all digital properties. We worked closely with them to better define what our content was worth on each platform in terms of post volume and frequency, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and that helped us empower our sales team uh, with perspective, uh, which is really important when they make deals and they understand that perhaps social shouldn't be a throw in on some of these deals. Uh, it could potentially frontline many of them. So, um, sorry, I thought my cat was puking. Um, all right, back to that. Um, also software, as mentioned before, like Track Maven, Gum Gum, and Nielsen, they can also help you track the success and the value, whether it's something as simple as the logo on the, uh, the backdrop of a press conference or an actual uh, you know, sponsored video series, um, being able to aggregate the numbers uh, and better track the performance can help with renewals. Those are those numbers that are a little more robust than what Facebook or Twitter offer at their base level, uh, but can provide that value and comparison information uh, to better understand and better empower your sales team to uh, to show that the partner got true true value out of this or perhaps not as much value as they anticipated so both very important pieces but ultimately it's about what fits your organization um, you know some money is better than no money so if social is being used to for lack of a better word uh, grease the wheels that's okay you know our job is to make money and sometimes it takes compromise uh, especially if it's uh, pieces of content you already plan on doing anyway and involving a sponsor does not degrade the value too dramatically so again important understand the value of what you produce uh, this is all stuff. I'm going to rush to this piece a little bit because it's kind of redundant. Let's go to Twitter Amplify a little bit. We'll change the, the topic a little bit from sponsored content to something that, uh, you know, some of us may be, um, <laughs> some of us may be familiar with. Uh, it is, uh, you have to get whitelisted. Uh, if you have the option to do that, please do so. Um, contact your Twitter rep uh, to get evaluated. When the AAF was still around, that was something that you know Don did a really good job of, uh, you know, getting uh, them whitelisted on there for, so all Twitter video could have an opportunity to pre-roll for it. Um, as I understand it, all the, the big five pro sports teams have the opportunity to do this. Um, and to dive into it, essentially, if you're not as familiar with uh, the platform. Um, whenever you share a video and you approve it for the Amplify platform, uh, Twitter will will roll some pre-roll before uh, your video content. And uh, this is something that has been tremendously successful for us. Um, hold on, my computer's freezing up a little bit here. For those that are aware, David Herman is going to be talking tomorrow from Twitter Sports. So it's an opportunity to kind of get uh, mm -hmm. more up-to-date details on how the program's working. Sorry, guys, my, uh, okay, there we go. Um, so we have generated a ton of revenue off Twitter Amplify over the past uh, two years or so. Um, in fact, we've generated so much that we've been able to add an additional video producer. Uh, it actually helped us make a case for, um, for travel for that video producer, and it's helped us with better behind the scenes access uh, after games and stuff like that. Um, it builds an internal reputation. If you are producing video anyway to engage your audience for social, and all of a sudden you're generating $100,000 a season off that content, um, people tend to look at social a different way. And that is something that's been really great for us because now what was once something that was probably a little bit more of a money out piece has become a major money in piece just from this platform alone. Um, this also helped us better understand what was gonna work and not work for our social strategy. Um, and so just to, you know, I'll, I forgot if I put this in later on the deck, but the Canes have made like, I want to say, uh, oh yeah, Neil, there is some bunch of jerk shirt stuff in there. I'm actually wearing one right now. Um, but, um, as far as videos that work best for Twitter Amplify, there really isn't a science to it. Uh, our philosophy right now is to monetize everything that the league rules allow us to, which is basically everything but highlight videos during the game. Um, we have found that um, cell phone video that is under 20 seconds in length seems to perform uh, much better uh, than, than average. Sometimes that'll generate uh, a couple thousand dollars in revenue for us, whereas a really nice hype video generates like 50 or 60. So the truth of the matter is that uh, there is no real science to, um, to it, but there are some trends we've been able to figure out. And and shorter, more digestible video is, is certainly a piece of that. That said, if you all remember uh, the Hurricanes emergency backup goalie situation, um, that video got about a couple million views. Um, 
that one made about 45 to 55 K for us in revenue. Um, our previous high from that was about $8,000 for a single video. So sometimes it's 20 bucks, sometimes it's 50 cents, sometimes it's $50,000. So that's a crazy range right there, but it just shows that you definitely need to be involved on this platform if you have the opportunity to do so. Um, one thing I that often comes up when other teams ask me about uh, other partners, there are ways to block competitive brands. Uh, so for example, uh, PNC Bank is a huge partner of the, the Hurricanes. So we make sure we block their competitors. There's a way to do that based on their Twitter handle. Um, but uh, this is a great tool. Uh, it's one I, I definitely stand by if you have the opportunity to use it. I understand not everybody will, but it's, uh, it's a really nice way to capitalize and generate revenue off content you're probably already producing. Um, and uh, just another way to monetize social and can also influence your social strategy uh, too. So, all right. Ticket sales. Um, again, back to the key concept of you understand your organizational goals. Some of you might not have a lot of tickets to sell. Some of you might have a very robust inside sales staff that would benefit from lead gen ads. Some of you, uh, the focus might be group sales or, or suite sales. Um, so you definitely have to devise the right strategy, the right advertising strategy to align with what your ticketing goals are. And the right way to find that out is communicating. Do they have inventory to sell? With the Panthers, that wasn't a big issue. We didn't really have more than a couple hundred or maybe a thousand tickets per game because our ticket staff was so good with PSLs. Um, so that definitely took a lot of pressure off us uh, to generate revenue and to monetize social. Um, we focus more on sponsored content. Um, you know, what, what is the real focus and what, what ads are going to work well for that? Um, sometimes leads are a bigger value. Lead gens, uh, and there are some case studies I'll get to later on here. Um, sometimes a lead is more valuable than a transaction through a paid uh, Facebook ad. So it just depends on what the goals are, but you have a number of different tools. Uh, and most of our success has been on Facebook and Instagram with actually um, yielding any type of conversion, whether it be a ticket purchased uh, for a single game or season ticket renewal or uh, or leads. Uh, we've traditionally, uh, the Hurricanes have seen the most success on Facebook and Instagram. That's not to say Twitter isn't a, a great advertising tool. It's just what works for our particular audience. Um, as I mentioned before, Organic social really is not going to yield ticket transactions. Um, I think one effective thing that everybody can do if you're still kind of having this, this battle with your ticketing team is to show the numbers, whether it be something as simple as a bit.ly link to demonstrate why or that people are not clicking on the link when you tweet buy tickets versus uh, maybe a paid camp or not a paid campaign, whether it's just a, an unpaid campaign to track the effectiveness of conversions. Um, it's important to make the case uh, in a perfect world, people would, kind of just trust that you know, you're gonna operate social in a way that will monetize, but sometimes it may take metrics to show that paid social is probably the, the best and most effective way to um, have a, a positive ROI through ticket sales. So use data to educate in a very gentle way. Also, I want to say for the people uh, in the back of the room, organic social yes. does not also drive in tune in. So if you're being asked to put a tweet out, yeah. drive tune in to something, particularly a TV show on a, Sports network, it does not work. Yep. So, gotcha. Okay, sorry. Got an email. Um, playoffs can sometimes be an exception. Uh, I'll even go back to the, the Canes last year. We, we did put out a few social posts about tickets being available, and it, we still sold out every game, but social didn't really play a big factor in there um, on the organic side. On the paid social side, yeah, yeah, we generated a ton of revenue with a very high ROI. But, uh, you know, really, it's important to, uh, to have your sales staff know that where social can play a role in ticket sales and where it really shouldn't be sticking its nose in. Um, so always oh, very important there. Uh, you know, it's, it's social can be a support tool. And I go back to the effectiveness of, of lead gen ads. Um, there's a bunch of case studies out there for sports brands that have been effective with uh, with those types of uh, campaigns that um, yielded a ton of ROI just from being able to pour leads into their inside sales staff's hands. Um, again, build a relationship with your audience. If you do social the right way, if you if you follow the best practices and you take uh, an effort in producing high quality content and engaging with your audience, and uh, that's going to yield a very nice dividend.
end when it is time for um, season renewals, ticket renewals, or things like that. Um, now, winning obviously helps. Uh, unfortunately, we do not control that. Sorry. Um, hold on. Uh, we do that. It's not something we control, but it's important to capitalize when you do win. And if that means that you can make a case for additional budget to be used for lead gen in order to um, maybe convert partial season ticket holders into full season ticket holders, um, use the opportunity the right way, but also make sure that your team is uh, aware, your ticketing team, that uh, if the team is losing, you have to be mindful with your messaging. So definitely. Do the fans know there. that you don't control the playbook or the person? <laughs> No, they haven't caught on yet, but that's that's part of it. I think uh, we'll eventually get there. I don't know if my camera's on or it's just a screen, but I do have a cat <laughs> on my desk, so that's just going to be part of it for for now. Um, there's no controlling cats. Uh, yes, yeah, so not a ton. I'm sure I can answer some questions here, but ultimately the key factor is that uh, paid social advertising, whether it's banner ads, email, paid. Uh, Facebook ads, Instagram, lead gen, that's going to be your ticket to success through uh, ticket sales. Um, it's going to cost you, but the, the ROI is, uh, is, is really strong. Um, and it, you we're in the business of getting results, not necessarily, um, you know, we don't want to bombard our fans with ticket messaging and it's not going to be effective. It's, it's going to hurt us in the long run. So the key is to make a case. Uh, and fortunately, Facebook has a bunch of case studies that show how, um, Paid social can be used to to generate revenue and monetize these platforms. Another key, it's important to build out these platforms the right way. So when you do advertise on them, it's more effective. So great ROI, better targeting. That's another factor too, is that lookalike audiences are something that are really, really going to help here. And if look, I won't lie. I mean, the Facebook's uh, ad model uh, is something that, excuse me, if they're their ad tool it's it's not the most uh, simple thing in the world to use it can be intimidating confusing and a lot of us who are who have been in this field for a long time we didn't grow up with paid social yeah. it's uh it's a learned skill uh and it's something that is not as simple so perhaps the option is to partner with an agency and there's no shame in that if there's a like a blue digital out there is the one we work with um they're an offshoot of Ticketmaster. They've done a great job for us in not only educating our staff in the right way to approach stuff, but helping us cultivate these audiences uh, in order to, um, you know, it's find success on these platforms. So definitely something to uh, to keep in mind. We have a uh, we have a we have a session coming up with Justin Satsman uh, on paid social 101 for those that are interested in in getting to oh yeah and that. I did sign up for that one. I'm getting some repeat slides here, so let me. Um, Let's jump to merchandise sales, if that's okay. Yeah, real quick um, question on the ticket sales front. Uh, this is from Joe. Response that I get when I speak out against organic ticket sales posts is, why not? It doesn't hurt us. How would you respond to that? And that's like a really great question of, yeah, it doesn't hurt us. Why not just put post it? Um, look, it's all about compromise and moderation. So sometimes you're not going to win that battle. Um and sometimes it's better to play nice and be like, all right, yeah, here it's fine. But every every opportunity you have to post for is an opportunity to to aggregate some data, to pull some metrics, and to say like, yeah, this this okay, this didn't really work. So why would we do it again? Um, so I think that sometimes you're going to have to bite the bullet and throw stuff out there. Um, social really should be used to inform when tickets are going on sale or when renewals are up or things uh I don't know uh, things like that. But uh, ultimately. It's, it does hurt in the long run. If your messaging is too focused on, on, on buy, you're asking something of your audience uh, consistently. Sorry, that's cat butt, so I'm just gonna turn her around. Um, if you, it's like the friend that we have, right? That always uh, you know, asks for help on something and then when you need help with something, they're never really around. Um, eventually your audience will tune out all of the messaging if you continuously ask them for, for anything. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. It's, it's, it's very hard for a lot of people, especially that don't work in digital to grasp this fact. They see a tool that has unlimited capabilities of posting and they say, well, yeah, why not? But the truth of the matter is that the more you abuse your audience, the, um, the more that the faster they'll go away if you don't invest in them. And that's where good content comes into play. Um, the content to me is something that's a give. That is something that you're not asking for anything in return besides a few minutes of their time to, to, 
you know, digest that content. If you don't invest in them and that kind of stuff, you cannot ask them to invest in you. By that same coin, um, if you are constantly pelting them with messages of buy or donate or there's this auction or buy this t-shirt, um, it, it's they're going to tune it out. Fans don't want to be sold to anymore, especially on social. Um, so it takes a lot of examples. It takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of data, uh, and it takes a lot of case studies to show that there are more effective ways of making money. And that's where being solutions based comes into play. That we don't want to be in the business of saying no. We want to say, well, okay, here's this idea. And sometimes you can lead people down the right path because they don't they don't know all the options that are available to us. They're not. It's not part of their function. Um, but if you can say, well, this paid campaign can be much more effective, look at the ROI here versus the ROI we've seen with these organic posts, why not do this one? And then if it's a question of their budget, they might be a little more hesitant to actually go down that road. So uh, a lot of times numbers can help. Um, it's a battle that we're going to face for a while, but if it's met with um, compromise and understanding and, and well-sourced data, um, eventually that should prevail. All right. So merchandise sales. Um, first thing I want to share is that uh, it, it depends on your organization. It's going to be different. Um, with the Panthers, uh, an external group um, handled a lot of merchandise sales. So, you know, we were sometimes on different wavelengths with that. Uh, with the Nets, it was a little different, but we definitely factored in some merch sales into our strategy. With the Hurricanes, uh, it is not only a major objective from ownership, but it's, it's something that uh, we've come to take a lot of pride in. So understand what your organizational goals are. If it's not really to sell a lot of merchandise, uh, don't waste your time on this a lot. Um, it's good to be aware of it uh, and what your options are, but ultimately understand what really fits. Um, process is what comes into play here. Um, that is something where you have to understand what your means are to produce or to ideate or, or work with different vendors to understand what your audience is going to buy. Um, and the, the one thing we found uh, at the Canes is that um, the standard stuff, the t-shirt jerseys that you can get in a store, um, it's not really going to, not really going to move the dial for you that much. New uniforms, those always will. It's the stuff that speaks to your audience. Uh, so your specific social audience is how you're going to generate the most revenue through social things that they're talking about, items that resonate with them. Typically, it's T-shirts. Occasionally, it's a hat. Um, and I have a few kind of uh, examples there. Um, one is the the bunch of jerk shirts, which I am I'm wearing because I have like three of these um, and I'm doing less laundry on account of lockdown. Um, that for those of you that aren't as familiar with the story, we. Um, the Hurricanes uh, last year gained some notoriety for their their post win celebrations after home games, which sometimes were them crashing into the glass and getting the fans all, you know, fired up. In other cases, you know, we had more elaborate ones, like we wheeled a basketball hoop onto the ice and somebody just slam dunk or Evander Holyfield came out and knocked out one of our players. And, um, the, these became very popular, but also a controversial topic in hockey media, which typically is a little more conservative. So, uh, former, Hockey analyst uh, Don Cherry during a game came out and basically called us a bunch of jerks. Um, and this was something that we acted pretty quickly on. It, it felt a lot like when people were for ragging on Cam Newton for like dancing in the end zone um, back in 2015. Um, nothing galvanizes a fan base like uh, like the media coming down on you hard while you're winning. So we wanted to capitalize. So we started mapping out shirt ideas basically during the game. We changed our Twitter bio. Um, and by the time the game was over, we texted ownership. This is like midnight, basically saying, here's our idea for T-shirts. And um, we got a response back in like 15 minutes. They wanted to see proofs the next day. Uh, it was President's Day weekend, so we had to work with not our normal printer. But we had shirt mock-ups on our uh, e-commerce site ready to tweet out on social um, less than 24 hours later. I believe it was like 2 o'clock the next day. Um, I had thought we were not going to order enough shirts because we only ordered like, you know, 600 or excuse me, I thought we ordered too many shirts with 600. We sold like 6,000 in the first week. So um, most of that was driven from social, which we were able to measure and then better determine the value of the social uh, that can drive merchandise sales. But not everything has had that same level of success. It was something that was born on social and then clearly was a higher uh, revenue opportunity because of that. So if I just threw out a random t-shirt one day, um, not a lot of people are going to buy it right now. It's got to be the right fit at the right time in order to actually make valuable revenue through merchandise sales. At least that's been the, the case in our uh, experience. Um, we had another 
example in uh, recent weeks feels like a year ago, but it was like a month ago. Um, the Canes had an emergency backup goalie win a game. Um, and during the game, since we had this process established, we were like, all right, we're making a shirt. And some of the details we figured out a day later with the donation aspect of it. But we had a shirt ready to go, ready for order. Um, that was a trending topic on social and in hockey Twitter um, before the or right around time the game ended. And because of that, we sold thousands and thousands and thousands of shirts uh, on something purely that was on social. It became a, a social movement, really, because there was a donation piece of it. Um, whereas if I was just dropping a random shirt on Twitter on a Sunday night or something, no one's really going to buy that. So the bottom line here is that uh, use your social um, to better understand um, kind of why people are buying and why they want uh, to buy and, and what they will likely buy there. Sorry, I'm trying to make the view of this better. Um, that has been our, our key to success there, but uh, you know, it's different for every team. Um, in some cases though, we've had Whalers night, which wasn't exactly a viral moment that we capitalized on. It was just a special game and we knew that merchandise would perform better on social. Whereas if uh, a random game or wearing our red jerseys, we're not going to put out a jersey tweet. So um, basically uh, know, know when to, to use social to uh, sell merchandise and know when to back off. And in most cases, um, you're not really going to move a lot of merch unless there's a significant deal or there's a reason why they want to buy. So with that, uh, kind of wrapping up everything here, because I've ranted for a while, um, the most important thing here is communication and planning and process and building relationships. Uh, that is always going to be the key to success in any field, but um, all of that really will help you build the right bridges and the right process in order to, to find ways to monetize your social. Um, that understanding your organizational goals are also very important. You don't want to waste time trying to make money off uh, season ticket members if that's already been maxed out. Perhaps merchandise is the only option for you, and, and then you can allocate your resources to, to support that the right way. Um, that said, I do think sponsored content is always an option to make money. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. It, it can be whatever makes sense for your capabilities as an organization, but there are always ways to, uh, to, to find the right path Path to attach a sponsor to something that's recurring or something that's a one-off in order to generate some revenue off it. And uh, Twitter Amplify, if you have the means to, to do that, uh, is a, it's a very, very effective tool. So I want to make sure I didn't miss anything on ticket sales. I may be able to answer the questions. I had some PowerPoint issues there, so I'm happy to, to dive into that one a little bit. But uh, in the meantime, happy to uh, answer questions. Well, thanks, Dan. A couple of quick questions I want to get to because I know we're running short out on time and I'm giving giving it to us. Uh, this one from Aaron Hodges. He's running a TikTok 101 session you should all sign up for. Um, well, the question just went away. But it was, how do you bet to do Twitter Amplify but not have ads all the time on video? Obviously, you can choose, but how do you know when mm -hmm. to turn on that pre-roll? It's a great question. Um, I mean, I like to say that it's blanket on as much as we, we can try to monetize off of, but in all honesty, there are times when we make the call to not. Uh, typically, if it's like a hockey fights cancer PSA, or if it's something that um, is a very serious topic, we don't want to cheapen that with, with an ad. Uh, plus, the fact is we can't control what ads appear before that, so the combo of the two could end up producing something pretty distasteful when that shouldn't really be happening. So um, if it's a highlight from after a game, always, if it's pregame soccer in one of the hallways, we should always be monetizing that, but um, there it's case by case. Um, and it's also another factor too, is that um, Twitter's profanity uh, ratings are, they're, they're tough. Uh, I got to say, we've gotten a few um, slaps on the wrist because we've had censored curse words from our post game locker room. Even if we put a goal horn instead of the curse word, it still does get triggered on their um, kind of their, uh, their no, no list, I guess you could say. Um, so we have gotten a few, few flags there. So that's something that we're very cautious about how we monetize uh, those as well. But as long as we're following league rules of not monetizing highlights in game, we wait till after the game. And that's where the storm surges have been great for us because they occur after the game. Um, we try to monetize just about everything possible uh, because we wanna be able to use that money to make a case for expanding our staff or access or equipment or whatever it may be. Another one from our guy, Dom, up in Seattle. Hope you're doing well. Uh, how do you approach getting buy-in for things like Bunch of Jerks and David Ayers and then monetizing? 
Yeah. Um, fortunately for us, it does start at the top. We have an owner that's very committed to letting us uh, try uh, certain things and take risks. Um, and uh, so right there, the, the buy-in was sort of accessible out of the box. Um, it's not always going to be like that, though. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it back to my days of the Panthers, you know, the, traditionally a more conservative organization. Uh, and it, it took a little bit of time to make other people comfortable with uh, kind of being a little more cheeky on social media um, or, or trying things in a different way. Um, and sometimes it just takes little, little tiny steps into the pool in order to, to show here's why this was effective and here are the numbers for this and here's the positive press we got from this. So sometimes you just try little bits uh, and then you can show that it's effective. And if it's not effective, then perhaps you should pivot into a different direction. But um, sometimes it, it will take stages of, of being making people more comfortable or showcasing examples from other similar brands to say like, well, look at the money they made here or look at the opportunity here. We could do something similar. Um, we have the means to, we have the resources. Um, so looking at what other people are doing, constantly paying attention to industry trends is something that will help you quite a bit. Awesome. Um, what are you in the hurricanes going to be doing to engage fans during the season's delay? This is coming to Yeah. Um, so we got a little ahead of it. We, um, when things really started getting a little more intense uh, outside the country, we started brainstorming quite a bit. Uh, different content ideas or inspirations that wouldn't rely on any hockey uh, going on. Things like uh, we, we, I had one of our people looking through SpongeBob's Instagram account for ideas and things like that um, to where we wanted to have the most robust strategy possible for editorial, for social, for video and for our design team um, possible. And so a lot of that was an intense brainstorming session of, all right, what can we do here? What is possible? How can we repurpose old content? Um, what is our tone gonna be? Is it gonna be informational at first and then uh, more focused on, um, on entertainment? And that gave us a pretty a pretty good list of stuff to work with uh, and then we're constantly adding. But the key is we've established a really strong creative communication process uh, you know, about a year ago. And that has helped us kind of add to that list constantly, but you have to start uh, empowering individuals first. Uh, put everyone on brainstorm duty, whether it's if their function is the website or if their function is social content, have them start building stuff out and collectively work with ideas so you can add to your bank essentially and uh, constantly have stuff that you can be building out while you figure out stuff in the short term. There's a post we made today that you know we, we planned on from a couple days ago and we decided to plug it in you know, here, just because it made more sense with a robust um, kind of content calendar. So uh, it, it's it's been a challenge, I, I won't lie, but we, we had the right process in place to where we were able to sort of um, operate at a very similar level. Um, so much of us work from home already that we were kind of built for this. So uh, you know, that, that, that made it a little easier, but we tried to get uh, be as proactive as possible in brainstorming and it's a constant growing list, but um, from our esports streams to some of our meme focused content, uh, all of it was planned about a week or two ago um, and we're slowly doling that out while kind of replenishing our bank. Uh, just two more questions again, I know we're running short on time. Mm -hmm. This one's from Carly Peterson. What is a day in the work life of Dan like? What are your day to day responsibilities? Now, it's definitely changed a lot over the years. I mean, early on, it was so much focused on community management on the social side and making sure things were operating appropriately on the, the other digital properties. Uh, now, and I'm not really on the keys anymore on social. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of answering emails and it's a lot of working uh, to empower my staff to make sure they have the support necessary uh, or the direction necessary to be successful. Um, you can only be as successful as your team. Um, so my, my key responsibility right now is to make sure that they're in position to succeed and uh, to make sure that I'm kind of helping manage uh, all the, the challenges that we face. So a lot more emails and a lot less tweets uh, is the, the short answer to that question. Awesome. And the last question, let's see if I can find one. Do you double add sponsored content with Twitter Amplify also? So. Um, we haven't had a lot of video series be sponsored yet, so we haven't had to tackle that. Um, but it is something that I think about uh, quite a bit of how we would handle it. I think it depends on the nature of the video content uh, and the relationship with the sponsor. I think in some cases it, it makes sense. Um, for example, if it's a post-game locker room video or if it's uh, a highlight series, 
okay. Um, but if it's something like a, a really, really uh, well-produced uh, video series that uh, you have a partner paying top dollar to be associated with, I think it wouldn't be right to monetize it doubly in those cases. So uh, not a great answer, but very much case by case basis. Um, a lot of it, you have to look at what kind of money you're going to be making through uh, Twitter Amplify versus the sponsorship piece. And I have to say, probably in most cases, you're going to make more money off the sponsorship deal than you would Amplify. Um, so it's probably better to go with the guaranteed dollars than the uh, hypothetical, but uh, very much case by case. And you should be looking for the opportunities to where you can double up. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. this was incredibly insightful for everyone. Uh, this well, thanks this, uh, for your time. Yeah, this recording is going to be available on demand. My guy Andres is going to make sure this gets up on our social, so please follow us there. Uh, we have a session tomorrow, same time with David Herman, Nikki, and Andres. Uh, if they can pop in the link to sign up on influencer.com/academy. There it is. Thank you, Nikki. Also, Nikki put together a Google Doc of everyone's social handles that attended and shared. Please follow, network, it's important. Uh, again, thank you, Dan, for taking the time out to lead this session. I truly appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry for all the rambling. I appreciate your time and thanks no, for the opportunity. Your rambling is <laughs> gospel for many of us, so I appreciate it. Hope you and your family and your cat stay safe. Thanks. As well as everyone else I was able to attend. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you all tomorrow for those that can attend. All right. Stay safe.